How can you integrate Keycloak with .NET Aspire? Keycloak is an open source identity management platform that you can easily run as a container. And in this video, I'll show you how to integrate it with Aspire orchestration and how to connect it to your .NET API. So let me just quickly show you the application that I have in place before we introduce Keycloak and authentication. I have a .NET 8 API and an Aspire orchestration project. And inside of the app host, I'm configuring a Postgres database. I'm going to call this database stocks. We're going to give it a volume so that we can persist the data between application starts. And then I'm going to add a reference from the web API project to the stocks database. And when I start this, we're going to see the Aspire dashboard, which you can see here. So our services are up and running. And if I jump into Postman and send a request to our API on the stock prices endpoint, you're going to get a response back that contains the prices for a couple of dummy stocks that I seeded when the application started. Now let's see how we are going to introduce authentication for this endpoint using Keycloak. The simplest way to introduce authentication on a minimal API endpoint is to call the require authorization method. What this is going to do behind the scenes is it's going to apply the authorize attribute as part of the endpoint metadata. You can see this here, initializing the authorize attribute. And what this method is going to do is it's just going to apply the authorize attribute. If we go a few methods deep, we're going to get to the require authorization core method, which is just going to append the attribute to the endpoints metadata. So this is how this works under the hood. Now, when it comes to Keycloak, let's start by introducing the Keycloak container or service as part of the Aspire orchestrator. So we are going to add a NuGet package to the app host project and I'm going to look for Aspire hosting Keycloak. This is the official NuGet package from Microsoft. However, we're going to have to look for the pre-release version. Now, there are a few of them to choose from. I'm going to choose version 8.2.2, which is the same as the Aspire hosting version that I'm using. So let's go ahead and install this package. And now, if I go back to the app host project, I will be able to introduce the Keycloak service. This is relatively simple. I'm going to add a variable to store the Keycloak resource. And then we're going to say builder add Keycloak. And this is a new extension method that we have with the NuGet package we just installed. Let's give a resource a name. I'm going to call it Keycloak. And then I'm going to choose a default port of 8080 where we are going to expose the Keycloak service. Now, if you actually want to persist the Keycloak data, we're going to introduce a data volume. And this will allow us to persist the Keycloak realm between application starts. Now, I'm also going to expose the HTTP endpoints by calling with external HTTP endpoints. And then I just need to add a reference from my API project to the Keycloak resource. And this is going to wire up the service discovery settings when we start Aspire. So let's go ahead and run the application. And now you will see the Keycloak service is up and running in the Aspire dashboard. If I open up the Keycloak services details, you should be able to see the environment variables that are configured by the orchestrator. These are going to be the Keycloak admin, which is just admin, and then a password that's going to allow us to authenticate with the Keycloak UI or the admin dashboard to be more precise. Now, if I navigate to localhost 8080 and I type in admin and I paste in the password, we will be able to log in to the Keycloak dashboard. And from here, we can create our custom realm that we're going to use to authenticate with our application. So let's go ahead and quickly do that. And let's also introduce a test user for demonstrating authentication. So I'm going to create a realm called stocks. It's going to be enabled. And then if I navigate to clients, I'm going to create a new client which I'm going to call the stocks public client. If I click next from here I'm going to leave direct access grant as enabled so that I can use the password authentication flow which is the simplest one for the purpose of our demonstration. So let's go ahead and create this client. Now we're going to need a user to actually authenticate with our realm. So let's go to the users tab and create a new user and I'm going to say that the user's email is verified and then I'm going to paste in just some dummy username and email as well as a name and a last name. So let's go ahead and create our user. And now we have our user stored inside of our Keycloak realm. The realm acts as a sort of a namespace or schema in a relational database, and it allows us to group the users for a particular application. In this case, our stocks realm is going to hold the users for the stocks API that we have with just a single endpoint. The user is also assigned a unique identifier, which you can use to reference this user from the Keycloak system in your own system 
system if you want to store a local copy and this will help you to improve performance slightly because you won't have to reach out to Keycloak to fetch the user's data. Now what I want to do next is go into the credentials tab and set a password for this user and I'm just going to say 123. I'm going to turn off the temporary flag and I just want a simple password for the purpose of testing. And if we jump into Postman real quick, I'm going to show you how we can send a request, a post request to the token endpoint. And this is a well-known URI for OpenID Connect where you can obtain a token from an OAuth server. In this case, we're going to use the password grant type and I'm going to specify a client ID that supports this grant type. We already set the username and password to some simple values for testing purposes. And if I send this post request, we're going to get back a response containing an access token that we can use to authenticate with our API. We're also getting a refresh token with a longer lifetime that's going to allow us to refresh the access token when it expires. And there's also the ID token, which isn't important for our use case. Now let's examine what we have inside of our JSON web token. If I go ahead and add the JSON web token on JWT.io, we'll be able to examine the contents of the token generated by Keycloak. And the first part here contains the algorithm that was used to sign this token. Then we have our payload, containing the issuer, the audience, and other relevant data for this user. And lastly, we have the signature that we can use to verify that this is indeed a valid access token that we can use to authenticate with our service. And all we needed to do to set up Keycloak was install an additional NuGet package that's going to run Keycloak in a container and from a code perspective, we needed to add three lines of code. So I think this is pretty awesome as far as Aspire goes with enabling Keycloak. Now let's see what we have to do to integrate this inside of our API application. If you recall, what we installed here was an Aspire hosting package. And hosting packages are used from the Orchestrator project to allow us to run resources such as Postgres, Keycloak, Redis, and so on. Inside of our client applications, such as the web API here, we need a different NuGet package and I'm going to look for Aspire Keycloak authentication. And this will allow us to integrate with the Keycloak resource that we are running using Aspire. Now I'm going to choose the version 8.2.2. Of course, when you are trying out after the release of this video, the versions might have changed. So just go ahead and use the same version as the Aspire hosting package that you are using in the orchestrator. I'm going to install version 8.2.2. And then let me show you how easy it is to integrate this inside of a .NET application. So I'm going to introduce a couple of services. First, I'm going to add authorization, and then I'm going to say builder services, add authentication, and this allows me to call a new method that's added by the Keycloak authentication NuGet that we just installed, and it's called add Keycloak JWT bearer. And this allows me to specify the service name that I've given to the Keycloak resource, which is just Keycloak. And this is the same name that we are using here. This is important to get right because this is how we configure service discovery. Then the next argument is the realm. So I'm going to give it the name of stocks because this is what I call my realm. And then I can provide a delegate to configure the JWT bearer options. And here you can set anything you like on the options. For example, you can set token validation parameters. What I'm going to configure is HTTPS metadata. I'm going to set this to false because we are in a development environment and everything is fine working just over HTTP. Now, the second thing I want to set is the audience, which is going to have the value of account. And you could have seen this value in the JSON web token that we examined just a few moments ago. We also have to include the middleware for authentication and authorization. So I'm going to say app use authentication and app use authorization. And this is all there is to it with just these few lines of code for adding the services and configuring the Keycloak resource and adding the respective middleware, we are able to integrate with the Keycloak resource running with Aspire. And this is going to allow us to authenticate with our API using tokens generated by Aspire. So let me show you how this works in practice. To be on the safe side, let's go ahead and send a token request again to obtain an access token. And now let's try to authenticate with the stock prices endpoint using this access token. Now to start, I'm not going to specify any access token. And if I send this request, I get back a 401 unauthorized response. So this is as expected. Now, if I specify the access token and send this request, you will see that we are getting back 200 OK. So authentication seems to be working. Now, what I want to focus on next is 
how this is actually working because I think it's very important to understand what Aspire components such as this one is doing under the hood. And in order to understand this, we're going to dig into the source code for the add key glow JWT bearer method. Now we're going to go into this one and this is where something interesting happens. So you'll see that we are configuring add JWT bearer. This is very typical when you're setting up JSON web token authentication. But what's also going on is we're adding an HTTP client called key cloak back channel. And then we are configuring the JWT bearer options. And this type contains a back channel property, which is actually an HTTP client that we can use to reach out to the key cloak server to obtain some metadata that's going to allow us to validate the access token. We're also setting up the authority, which is the actual URL value pointing to key cloak. And if we go into this method, you will see that it's setting up the authority with service discovery. So we can choose between HTTPS and HTTP. The server's name is what we assigned to the resource when we configured it with Aspire, which was just key cloak. Then we have realms and then the name of our realm, which is called stocks. So this is what is going on behind the scenes. Now let me start the application again. And if I go ahead and send another request to this endpoint, we're going to get a response back after a few moments. So you can see it took a bit longer than expected, but now I want to jump into the Aspire dashboard and look at the distributed traces. And you can see the trace here, which took a couple seconds. So let's go into this trace. And what you will find is, yes, we have our API request to the stock prices endpoint, which is this span here, but there are also additional requests, which are get HTTP calls to the key cloak service. So if we go into this span, you can see that we are sending a request to this endpoint here. So I'm going to copy the value and this is pointing to our key cloak resource and the stocks realm and the URI is well known open ID configuration. So if we send a request to this endpoint, we're going to get back the OAuth discovery information. And this contains a list of endpoints that you can call to perform additional operations on the OAuth server. For example, here is the token endpoint, and this is the URI where you can access this endpoint. There's also an authorization endpoint, the issuer, and this endpoint here, which gives you back the JSON web key set. And let's go ahead and send a request to this endpoint. So the URI is realms, stocks, protocol, open ID connect, certs, which is short for certificates. And if we send this request, we're going to get back the public keys that we can use to verify our access tokens. So every key has a key ID. And why is this important? So let's go back to our JSON web token and I'm going to copy the latest value from here. And if I paste in this value, you're going to see the algorithm that was used to sign this JSON web token, which is RS-256. And there's also the key ID that we can use to verify the access token. So if we go back to the response we got in Postman, you will see that we have the same key ID here. So this is what's actually happening behind the scenes. Our application is sending a request to Keycloak to this endpoint here so that it can find the JSON web key set and this contains the public key that we can use to validate the access token and confirm that we can use it for authentication purposes. If I go back to the distributed traces you can see what's happening here. So this first request is going to call the discovery endpoint which is going to return a list of endpoints that we can call on the Keycloak server and then we're going to access the certificate and validate the token. And only after this completes, we send a query to our database to retrieve the stocks. Now, if I send the same request a couple more times and we go back to the distributed traces, you will see that the spans are a bit smaller. We are no longer reaching out to Keycloak because we cache the configuration values locally inside of our application. Another thing you can see if you go into the logs for the API service is that service discovery is working as you might expect. Here is a GET request to Keycloak, which is using the logical name for the service, which is HTTPS plus HTTP. So this is service discovery. And then the name of our Keycloak resource, which is just Keycloak. And then it's able to resolve the physical address, which is HTTP localhost 8080, and append the rest of the URI. If you enjoy understanding how everything works under the hood as much as I do, then go ahead and smash the like button under this video. And if you want to see how to deploy a .NET Aspire application, then go ahead and watch this video next. Check out my courses to improve your .NET and software architecture skills. And until next time, stay awesome.